Let me start with a bold statement. We are not living in the country that most of us are trained to think we live in. And it's important to clear this up. And this lesson looks at the pieces of American history that historians have ignored, probably because they don't understand the monetary system. And this system has converted us into a financial empire. American history suggests we started a country on free principles that last to this day, where the population rules. But if that's the case, why do both political parties constantly do things that a massive majority of the people don't want? This lesson explains why. The original power structure in the Republic is diagrammed here, with the states voluntarily organized around a central governing document. The states are drawn as pyramids for a deliberate reason. A pyramid represents an economic engine and growth potential, and political and social power. Each state had its own ruling class, merchant class, and working class. States had their own banks, main street businesses, and towns and neighborhoods where people exerted power together in local communities. The point is that the states were autonomous units, and political power and economic growth engine were not at the federal level. This was a good mix between Jeffersonian ideals and Hamiltonian principles. Jefferson represented what I'll call horizontal forces. He was from rural, agrarian interests and wanted to keep power distributed so that horizontal relationships between people and local community would be the basis for bottom-up power in the republic. Hamilton represented vertical forces. He was connected with wealthy urban interests and wanted power and wealth to be able to consolidate vertically to drive economic growth. Then after the Civil War, the power structure shifted. States were then explicitly put under the federal level government in terms of political power. And then in 1913, the Federal Reserve was created, which, as people warned at the time, would be a dramatic, fundamental change in the character of the United States, where economic power shifted from the states to the federal level. This was the seed of the American financial empire. It was the head of a new potential pyramid that would encompass everything by putting everything else in debt. And the Federal Reserve is actually just a cartel of private banks, working with governmental license to control all money in the country. It's a public-private partnership which established the most powerful monopoly in history, typically called Wall Street. Shown here with the requisite American flag behind it, because Wall Street loves to associate itself with the idea of American freedom. But Americans are generally opposed to cartels and monopolies because, by definition, they violate the free market and they have nothing to do with freedom. For example, we don't like OPEC, but we seem to have no problem with the Wall Street cartel. And this brings us to the first key flaw of neoclassical economics which has really become a religion. It calls our system under a privately controlled monopoly a free market. Not even close. Macroeconomics is completely monopolized. We'll cover many more flaws over the rest of this course, but the primary one is this issue of money monopoly. Now, This monopoly even gave the primary banks power over the states and the federal government because the Federal Reserve Act even made them dependent on money from the banks. This marked the death of Thomas Jefferson and the balance between horizontal and vertical forces. The height of this new pyramid was so massive that Hamiltonian vertical forces would be allowed to completely dominate. We'll see in the next lesson more about this, but at this point it just means allowing wealth and power to consolidate into the hands of a few. Now also in 1913 the IRS was created as a key component of driving these vertical forces. The IRS does not exist primarily to fund, to fund your kid's school lunch program or whatever else we may think from watching the evening news, Instead, it exists to fund a banking cartel, as you'll see in a minute. So at this point, a very powerful vertical machine had been built, and it's pictured on this screen. Then in the 30s, the Great Depression effectively chopped states off the knees and made them smaller in terms of power and autonomy. It also made we the people smaller, as everybody was poorer. So everything at this point was entirely dependent on the banking cartel because the government itself couldn't even issue money anymore. So this was the point uh, to crank this new debt machine into high gear. The banks pumped out debt, cycled it through the states, and the value plus interest was fed back up to the top by the IRS and the legal system which still today serves the banks. After a few generations of repeatedly cycling debt and actively changing our laws to break down state power and boundaries to corporate expansion, the country was completely changed into something that looks like this. This is a corporate overlay that operates almost everything in the U.S. as one integrated system. What's reflected in the pyramid is power. That's the vertical axis. Each layer has more power than the layer under it. The first thing to notice is that the Constitution no longer appears here, and neither do the states, at least as separate autonomous units. Instead, all power in the system is driven by the dollar. It aligns everything in the pyramid. It does this because it actually is not a sovereign U.S. dollar, but it's instead a debt instrument of the Federal Reserve. 
This surprises some people because the dollar is just something that sort of pumps out of ATM machines as if it's part of nature. But, of course, it's not. It's man-made product managed by people just like any other corporate product. And those people are who I've labeled owners at the top. Now, this might sound really odd because we are trained to think we live in a free democracy. I'll more fully explain this in other lessons, so please hang with me for a while if you don't believe it. At this point, I'm just talking about the people who created the original Empire Seed back in 1913 and still control it today. And the Fed is at the top of the pyramid because it's the corporation that manages the product. Most of the dollars it manages aren't actual dollar bills, but instead electronic digits sitting in your bank. So the banks are next in this pyramid. They're dependent on the Fed's monetary and regulatory decisions, so they're below it in terms of power. But of course, since the Fed's just a cartel of these banks, uh, the power hierarchy is murky to say the least. But the banks are above everything else because they effectively govern the rest of the system by running the debt machine. So the multinational corporations form under the banks. They are the primary customers of the elite banks. They're dependent on them. They have to report to them every three months. They take bank credit, funnel it through their machines, and then pass it back up to the banks. You can kind of think of the Wall Street banks as modern-day feudal lords and the multinational corporations as their feudal knights out conquering more territory. Then below this middle layer are the layers of the old republic that don't really matter to this new empire. And they'll be continually squeezed out of existence as a simple result of the math of debt-based money. The states are now just administrative districts, and they're all now virtually bankrupt as a result of being subjugated to this machine. Community banks and state banks, main street businesses, and small farmers, mom and pop shops, these are all being squeezed as well since the big banks get virtually free money from the Fed so they can pump out mega levels of debt to the multinationals and gobble up territory. And then below that level is all of us. All the people working for a wage, consuming products, paying debt and taxes. We actually create all the value in the system. All the individual people do. And that value is then mined by the top and passed back up via the IRS and the legal system which serves the banks. This is the key to the power of this system. This is why the American empire became the sole global superpower, because we Americans voluntarily let our value creation be stripped quite aggressively so that it can be handed over to the rich institutions that hold our debt and then keep cycling back through the system. This middle layer has come to be called too big to fail. It's a phrase we've heard in the news and it's become generally accepted among Ivy League economists, but it's actually just an Ivy League ruse. The idea that we need these large institutions in order for us to continue living is absurd. Too big to fail is actually a doctrine that attempts to justify transferring wealth and value from the bottom layers, like all the people, the states, and the bus local businesses, and passing it up to these upper layers in order to keep this system intact. Natural forces would ebb and flow, cycling back and forth to keep power from consolidating at the top. But too big to fail trumps those natural cycles by using the force of the U.S. government to extract value from the smalls at the bottom and handing it over to these bigs in the middle of the pyramid. This is the proper way to interpret what the government has done in response to the crash of 2008. And that's the role of the U.S. government in this system. It actually isn't in the pyramid because it's really not our government anymore. Rather, we're governed day to day by this debt system, the banks, and the corporations. The government's just there to mop up these lower layers and make sure they play the role they're supposed to play. The big business interests at the top of the pyramid could not exist without government doing this for them. It's the only way to keep this pyramid intact. Now, why does the government do it? Well, it's in debt and therefore controlled by the banking system as well. It's not a sovereign government because it can't issue its own money. A government that's inferior to a bank is not sovereign. And that brings us to the end of the first lesson where we've covered the, con the conversion of this constitutional republic into the post-war republic, then to the monolithic 20th century debt machine, and finally to today's completed top-down financial empire. As I said at the beginning, if you continue to believe you live in a free republic, you'll be constantly frustrated. This more complete version of American history hopefully clears things up. It's unfortunately missed by historians in our textbooks because apparently historians don't understand money, as almost nobody does. So now let's dig into money in more detail. You may not believe the issue of empire yet because they're based on top-down control. In the past, emperors have used militaries and weird people in weird costumes on horses called knights to exert their power. A lesson two shows how debt and debt-based money is the basis for top-down control in our empire. We learned in the first lesson that we live in an empire based on debt, so now we need to explore how debt exerts power and control. This will challenge many preconceived notions of Economics 101. I think most of what we think about economics is completely wrong. 
and this lesson will reveal how the notion of a free market is an illusion. We saw this diagram in lesson one showing the government off to the side, not really part of the pyramid. So what really governs this system? It's the bond market. So the first thing to note is that this basically means the stock market's irrelevant. Even though it's the focus of every nightly news program, it's just a distraction from what really matters when it comes to understanding power in this empire. The stock market is dwarfed by the bond market and all the other international markets for debt instruments. That's what a bond is. It's a debt instrument. It gives the owner a claim on an underlying asset or organization. Now, that might be a company, a state, or a country, but those things are just groups of people. So at the end of the day, these bonds give the owners a claim on people. It gives them a claim on the value created by the people today and in the future. So people's labor is, in effect, owned by the bondholders. And the people who are under the bond's control are forced to work in order to pay it off. And that's because there are always more of these bonds in the system than dollars. There's always more debt than money. In fact, there is no money in this system unless the country is in debt. And you can see this by just looking at the Fed's balance sheet. You'll always see more bonds than Federal Reserve notes or dollar bills. This does two critical things. One, it puts the entire country in a state of scarcity. It forces the population to basically jump on the hamster wheel. And two, it forces the population to have to go to commercial banks to get more money because there will otherwise never be enough money to pay off the debt. This is the beauty of this cartel system from the perspective of the bankers. The Fed is able to keep the U.S. government in a servitude relationship based on scarcity, which then forces about 310 million people to be customers of the commercial banks in order to have money. Brilliant. And that's where money comes from today. It's just electronic digits sitting in banks. It does not come from the U.S. government. Now, most of these bonds are sitting on the balance sheet of the Fed and commercial banks and other financial institutions like the Bank of China and the Bank of Japan. So let's be clear what this means. The productive value of American population's labor is owned by financial institutions, and most of it happens to be owned by foreign institutions today. And then a large part is also owned by rich, connected individuals in a complex array of financial LLCs, capital firms, and equity partnerships. This means that almost the entire population is working, spinning on the hamster wheel, to pay the owners of these bonds. And that's an extremely powerful wealth-generating upward force within this pyramid system. Wealth moves up the pyramid. This is what I meant by Hamiltonian vertical forces in the previous lesson. Now this means it's also a very powerful downward force in terms of power and control. The owners of those bonds have top-down power and control over everything else in the system. They have leverage, basically. In financial academic circles, debt is discussed as a means of building leverage or of gaining control over an underlying asset. This became famous in the hostile takeover days of the 80s, but leverage always exists over all the assets in our system, and still does today. Whether that's a multinational corporation, or a small business, or nonprofits like schools and churches, families are controlled by the bond market. In fact, most people in the world are controlled by the bond market in ways they aren't aware of. State governments are controlled by it, and of course the U.S. government itself in Washington, D.C. is controlled by the power of the bond market. This means organizations like the police and military are influenced by the bond market and these bondholders because every organization needs money, and all money comes from these bonds. Power and control is established by the bond market's hierarchical debt system. The lower you go in this pyramid, the higher the cost of money. So the Fed issues money for free. Cartel banks create money for minimal cost, depending on the Fed's policy, which is right now less than 1%. And then each layer of this pyramid has to pay more in order to get money, to the point where individuals at the bottom have to pay around 29% in this current market for credit card money. On the flip side, this means the availability of money goes down as you go down the pyramid. The Fed has almost no limit because its cost is zero, and the further down you go, the less money is available. About the only way for individuals to get money at the bottom is by working for one of the other layers, which is again the issue of scarcity. Individual people have no money because it's so scarce that they must get a job with a big institution. And the higher their job in the pyramid, the more money they'll make. This isn't because they'll be creating more value. On the contrary, most of the people creating real value in the economy, like farmers and assembly line workers, make very little money. The reason people make more money in the higher rungs of the pyramid is because higher layers have more power and control, given this monetary system. They have what's called seniorage because they're closer to the ownership layers, so the cost of money is lower to them, and money is drawn to the lowest cost, so these layers have more money. 
Now, all of this means you're effectively governed day to day by these people. These are the big bond trading desks at Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan Chase, UBS, Deutsche Bank, the Fed, the Bank of China. Their collective action determines who gets money and therefore who has power. Again, these people govern the world on a day-to-day -day basis, while the people at the top of the pyramid govern it on a strategic basis. They tweak the system over time to change the incentives for these bond traders, which ripples all the way down to you and me in very powerful ways. We saw this in 2008 very clearly when the actions of these people, based on the crazy policies of these people, caused a near-global meltdown. But they have just as much power and control in normal times because they have all the leverage. So here's a question. Is this a wealth generation system, as we're trained to think? Well, it certainly is for these people. But if it is for everything else in the system, then why is the United States stuck with what's up to around $100 trillion in debt and total unfunded liabilities? Well, it's because this isn't a wealth generation system, instead, but it's a debt generation system, which is really clear for these lower layers that are bankrupt. It's less clear for these middle layers because even though the institutions are driven by debt, the people in them can accumulate wealth given their high salaries and commissions and bonuses since they're dutifully serving in the upper layers of this empire system. Now here's another question. Does this sound like a free market? <clears throat> does it facilitate freedom? Again, it certainly does for the top, but for the other layers, this is a servitude system. This is hard for many in the middle class to detect because as the system inflates, they feel free because they accumulate money and they're able to work and buy things. But they seem to ignore the accumulating debt. And they also ignore the lower layers that are clearly in servitude, like the less developed countries that are co-opted into this system, like those John Perkins describes in his book Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Even for most of the rich guys in the upper middle layers, like Wall Street and the multinationals, they only get their money because they're serving the controllers. Many of them have to work 80-hour work weeks to get their money. Are they free? And this brings us to more flaws of neoclassical economics. It completely ignores the issue of our money being nothing but debt, which is like ignoring that the sky is blue when you walk outside. It ignores the artificiality of the scarcity condition, and it takes it as a given, rather than trying to imagine what another system might look like. It equates net worth with value creation, it assumes a rich guy must have created a lot of value, but we know that's a complete fiction. And it erroneously assumes everyone is a rational, free, equal person within the system by ignoring the power differential caused by the fact that our money is nothing but debt. So, what do you think of this system? Do you still believe we live in a free market? We'll dig further into this question in the next lesson as we discuss the issue of ownership. Well, we've challenged American history and Economics 101, so now it's time to look at Civics 101. This lesson suggests that what we think about our government is off base, and we need to adapt to the truth so we can understand what happens in the world, rather than endlessly yelling back and forth between Democrats and Republicans. The previous lesson explained the truth about our monetary system, shown here, and briefly mentioned that we are governed day to day by these people. And all of this is dramatically different from what passes for conventional wisdom. I would suggest that's because the media portrays the wrong system. It projects this little pyramid in front suggesting that the government's in charge and corporations are beneath it and then all the people are at the bottom and have power over the government. But the real power structure here is hidden. And once every four years when it comes time to try to be serious and participate in government, the media portrays the corporations as the enemy of the left and it portrays government as the boogeyman of the right. And that if we just get them get the one right person in a distant White House, then all our problems will be solved. But of course it never works because these people aren't really in charge. You know, like this guy a while back who was quickly replaced by this guy on the left, then we swung back to the right, and then back to the left, and we wonder why nothing ever changes. At each shift, popular opinion thought we'd fix the system. Politicians talked about hope and change and got us all excited, but they don't really run things. Again, these people do. So, hope and change from the mouths of politicians is no match for the power of the bond market. And this is what George Carlin tried to point out to all of us before he passed away. Most people think he's just a comedian, but with these words, he proved he's a prophet. He warned people not to be distracted by the politicians, because they're just put there to give you the idea that you have freedom. Instead, he said that we are all owned. 
And that may be hard to stomach, but the math of the bond market proves it because the value you create in your work all day, every day, gets cycled up to the people who own the bonds and create no value. So Mr. Carlin is asserting here that this idea of freedom, that humans have dignity and should not be owned, as explained in the Declaration, has pretty much disappeared. Now the secret sauce of maintaining the system is the little-known method of long-term capital control. What the ownership class has learned through the years is that if they get exposure to the public, their capital is at risk, and they might be the object of the public's anger. So in effect, they've learned to hide. In order to understand this, we can look at the pyramid from the top down, building it layer by layer from the bottom up, which gives us the perspective of peeling the layers of an onion to get to the core. On the outside of the onion, or the bottom of the pyramid, is the public. It's all of us, and most of us only get exposed to what the media shows us. And now the media projects these people, the professional operators. These are the people who get broadcast into our living rooms on the TV screen as if they're in charge. So we might see a corporate CEO in a $5,000 suit, or a president, or another politician, or a general, but they're not really in charge. Behind all those operators are a bunch of lawyers and financiers and strategic advisors and PR professionals who hold a lot of power as they work for the innermost layer, the owners. And now, anyone can buy a bond, so we think anyone could be an owner. But the real owners are the ones who have built up strategic ability to control and exert power over this system. These are people we never see on TV. And some might suggest this is conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theory, but it's just the basic method of corporate governance. This is the way it works. Operators are paid for their expertise in running corporations, while the owner's expertise is controlling them. It's a basic aspect of capitalism. Anybody who's been close to the top layers of a corporation knows that people from the outside, like a senior lawyer, financier, or strategic advisor that might be 3,000 miles away in D.C. or New York, can call the CEO and tell him or her what to do. So the people in the corporation aren't really in charge, and these owners have learned to apply this control system to other aspects of life, like government. Now, these controllers are generally born into elite families, and they go to Yale or Dartmouth, Harvard, Princeton, or lesser-known Northeast colleges like Williams College for undergrad. And the financiers and lawyers who work for them aren't born into these families, but earn their way into Harvard Business School or Yale Law School in order to become part of this inner club. Of course, I'm not talking about all graduates of these institutions by any means. I'm just talking about a select few. And these schools don't really teach this system, but the select few learn about it informally through networking and gaining access to the right social group or society or club. The few, fee the few people from these schools who happen to be in the key positions of the pyramid, whether it's the media, the corporate world, the government, the military, the powerful lawyers or financiers, they all happen to be in one New York-based club called the Council on Foreign Relations. And this group writes all the policy documents and white papers that become U.S. law. And again, all the people in key positions are in this group. So this is the corporate planning and governing body of the U.S. It operates just like a board of directors. And now, I'm not making a value statement here, but just trying to explain the way our system really works, because I think you deserve it. But this guy might be making a value statement. The people on the inner layers of the onion, the upper layers of the pyramid, these are the people Martin Luther King referred to here as the protectors of the status quo. This system greatly benefits the inner layers and keeps most others in the dark, so it's in their interest to play along. In fact, the incentives can be so powerful that some of these people have no option but to play along. But this means we don't live in sort of a flat, free market system. And Martin Luther King saw through the illusion of our supposed free market, and I hope you do as well now. I hope you see that we don't live in a free republic with a free market, but rather a financial empire controlled by people who control debt and therefore have ownership rights and leverage over the system. So which system are you cheering for? We're in a difficult position because if we're patriotic to the system portrayed on the national news, then we're supporting the system killing the very America that most of us think we're patriotic to. And here's a more important question. Which system are you working for? If you're working for a large corporation, a Wall Street bank, a federal agency, or unfortunately even some of my old brethren in the U.S. military, you're fueling the top layers of this empire system. And that may be fine, it may be what you want to do, but I just think it's important for us to understand the truth of what we're doing rather than falsely believing that we're serving a free republic. 
And Gandhi said, be the change you want to be in this world. So if you're working for a large empire organization, are you being the change you want to be? And remember, this empire is holding a massive hammer to the tune of about 50 to 100 trillion in total debt and unfunded liabilities. That's leverage. That's ownership control over the republic. As many people have warned throughout history, way too many to include on this slide, debt is one of the best ways to enslave a country. It can be a fatal disease of republics. And so I hope this lesson has explained how our debt situation has done exactly that and put, put us all under the control of those who have the leverage. This is not the governance or political system we're trained in, nor is it the system we see on the corporate TV networks, the loud cable channels, or the radio shows. None of it correctly understands our system, and therefore all of it leads us astray. I say, turn off the TV. We must start living in the real world because this system affects human life and the natural world in powerful ways we might not like. We'll cover that in the next lesson on the culture of empire. Given the foundation laid by the first three lessons, we're now ready to think about the culture of this empire system and its impact on things like life, community, and nature. And I get to relax a little bit more, breathe, and let some feelings in instead of just dumping cognitive facts on you like I did in the first three lessons, as I thought it was important to kind of chug through those foundational concepts. Now this lesson will probably challenge some of your pre-existing ways of thinking if you come from either a standard left or right perspective that we get programmed in by the media. I think both of those are designed to distract us. I hope we can work through that to come to the truth. So what's the sense of having a system if it's not designed to enrich dimensions like life, community, and nature? As I asked in the introduction of this course, how can the banking establishment's economists continue to justify what's really become an insane system. Regardless of the elegant equations, their economic theories are built on false assumptions about the world that have done a lot of damage to the world. But they seem to be so attached to their academic frameworks, and sorry to say, but their Wall Street paychecks, that they can't see the obvious staring them in the face. This lesson will dig into some of the attributes of our system that have been discussed at times by sociologists, psychologists, or philosophers and theologians. In fact, Everybody. I mean, anyone who's not an Ivy League economist. But I think some of these folks have misdiagnosed the issue because they didn't understand the basic monetary foundation causing all the problems. And it's this issue of P is less than P plus I. The foundational mathematical inequality upon which our system is built. It's completely unstable. It's the cause of the rest of what we'll cover in this lesson. P is principal and I is interest. So at any given time, we the people in the economy have P dollars, and at the same time, the banking establishment has a claim on P plus I. So the banking establishment is basically a mining operation extracting wealth from the people. And those who think this is just for incremental loans in the economy need to watch lesson one and two again. All the money in our system has interest attached to it. We have no sovereign money. So the economy is constantly chasing more money to feed and pay off the banks. This means the foundation of our system is fundamentally unstable. It causes many of the problems talked about in other disciplines and the problems that we'll discuss in this lesson. The first one is that since the banks have a claim on more money than what's in the system, we are living in what I would call a wealth illusion. The numbers in your bank account aren't really dollars of wealth, but poker chips of the banking system. You can cash them in for stuff while the game continues, but once the music stops, you'll realize you don't have an asset, but a conditional liability, a liability of the bank. You have debt-based dollars. And this brings two more key flaws of neoclassical economics. It ignores the issue of our unstable foundation by taking it as a given, rather than thinking about what might be a more stable foundation. And it isn't quite honest about the definition of your wealth, because it calls our debt generation engine a wealth generation engine. Now another trait of our culture of empire is the divided society between the money pushers on top and the rest of us that are the money users. The pushers live in the abundant world of P plus I, where life is pretty good, while everyone else lives in scarcity, the P world, where everybody is scrambling to pay more dollars than they have back to the banking establishment. This means we have an aristocratic or oligarchic system, which is by definition not freedom for most people. 
Now, we're still trained to think we have freedom and we don't have a class-based society in the U.S. or an aristocracy, but it's just not true. This financial aristocracy pulls wealth from the masses without the need for knights or other archaic ways like kings did in the past. Now it just happens automatically because of the banking and legal system. So this means not only are we living under a wealth illusion, but also a freedom illusion. This is difficult to detect while the system is inflating because most people feel good and ignore the fact that they have a ruling class or aristocracy. You know, the music's cranking, the beer's flowing, the shoppers are shopping, but that doesn't change the fact that we're living in a tiered society. And once the system stops growing, it'll become real clear. This is really important to understand because freedom has gotten a bad rap as all the problems caused by our monetary system are chalked up to freedom. And it gets blamed for the sorts of things we'll be covering in this class. Nothing could be further from the truth. We are not living in a free market. We are not living in freedom. We are locked in a broken monetary system that requires us to behave in damaging ways. Do you really think a free people would have built this system? Don't let the aristocracy blame you and your supposed freedom for the problems their system has caused. And then don't let them use it to justify even more top-down control over you. Again, the problem is the monetary prison they designed to control everyone else. Now, another result of this monetary system is exponential growth. The system must grow perpetually, exponentially, as you can see in this exponential equation. Now, this is a, uh, oh, I don't know, it's a slight problem maybe, because Earth is finite and humans are not robots. It can't go on forever. And this causes all the problems associated with perpetual industrialization, increasing consumerism and endless shopping malls, and perpetual resource consumption. Now this is a picture of what used to be gorgeous Appalachian Mountains in Kentucky. And they've been literally turned into a wasteland. All of these problems are necessary because of our system. People like to blame the masses for this. No, not at all. We must do this. We are hostage to a broken system. Blame the folks who built the system. Don't blame each other. If we don't continue shopping and buying more, th and more cheap stuff from China, well, we lose our jobs, companies go out of business, we can't pay for our kids' college, and on and on. We have to do those things. Now, the other symptom of this problem is exponential debt growth. It's no accident that states are bankrupt. It's no accident that the politicians keep increasing the debt ceiling either. They must do this. Our system is built on ever-increasing debt. Our money supply can only grow if our debt grows, thanks to the Fed monopoly system. And this guaranteed debt growth causes guaranteed inflation. That's why the dollar is worth pennies compared to what it was 100 years ago. And guaranteed inflation results in guaranteed deflation. We got a taste of that in 2008, and much more is coming, probably sooner rather than later. And that guarantees more bankruptcies and foreclosures. In fact, those are guaranteed even during inflation because there's never enough poker chips or bank money for everyone to be able to pay off their debts. Remember from lesson two, there's always more debt than money. But once deflation sets in, there's no end to the number of people who will face default. And don't blame the little people once this happens. Don't, don't look down on people walking away from their homes. It's not their fault, really. Historically, the middle class and lower class get angry at each other when they should both look up to the ruling class and blame the monetary system they built, which set up the problem from the very beginning. And so we have another fundamental flaw of economics. It ignores exponential growth. And that was a manageable oversight as the baby boom fueled population growth, but that's now reversing itself, and it will cause a catastrophic end to this system if it's not changed. The scale of the system increases as P is less than P plus I drives exponential growth. Basically, we're on a perpetual motion machine toward bigness. The height of the pyramid gets higher as the pyramid itself grows. And the system funds both the corporate world and government, which is why both of those realms keep getting bigger. We keep going towards big business and big government. It never reverses itself. And the bigger it gets, the more detached it is from individuals and local community. So Democrats and Republicans, Left and right both may seem to be in op opposition, but actually they work together to drive bigness because the system we're all caught in is designed to do so. And after growing for 70 years, most of us are now stuck in a system so massive, so beyond our daily existence that we can't comprehend how it works. 
We can't comprehend why it works or if it works or when it might stop working. That's a serious problem. We are also helplessly dependent on mega institutions to provide our survival needs. In other words, we've outsourced our survival. We're in total dependency mode. That's quite a leap of faith. We've left it up to this Ivy Leaguer, who luckily appears to be praying in this picture, but system's so big we can't tell he's just making the problem worse. Then we've got another Ivy Leaguer in charge who has spent his life working for global banking interests and thought he didn't have to pay U.S. taxes. You trust him with your survival? Should we really have a system that makes hundreds of millions of people dependent on a few Ivy Leaguers? Or before them, these Harvard guys, along with Greenspan, that rigged the system to superinflate well beyond where it should have and basically set up a much bigger problem. The scale is so big that we can't see how they set up the coming biggest disaster in history. It's going to impoverish many. But since Time Magazine back then said they saved the world, yeah, sure, let's call him a savior. We have little option to believe it, because we can't tell if what they do works or not. And the system's so big we can't tell the actions of this guy, who attacks nations to transfer billions to himself should be outlawed. But we can sure see when a neighborhood kid transfers a $3 candy bar to himself by robbing a convenience store, and boy, we want him prosecuted, while Soros gets idolized by the investor class as a brilliant man. Literally, this system's insane. Soros' attacks are legal, given the system set up by the Ivy League economists over the years, but they result in impoverishment of millions, which ends up looking like this. The same picture we've seen in endless countries around the world as the scale of the system goes global and currencies get attacked. The little people know they're being screwed. When you impoverish others, you should be prosecuted. But the strategic people that control our financial system also happen to, a lot of, also happen to have a lot of leverage over the legal and justice systems. And they want this to happen as they standardize each country under the Anglo monetary system, which I'll be discussing in a future lesson. But they know the scale of what they're doing is so big that they can get away with it because most people won't be able to tell what they're doing until it's too late. And beyond the simple issue of scale comprehension are the deeper issues. Like this debt-based monetary system has grown so big that it has crowded out everything else to the point where we've lost a sense of meaning because everything has been monetized. We see this in human interactions and relationships where the famous question people ask at social events is, so what do you do? Because what you do to earn bank credit is pretty much what defines you in this system. And a child's dream about her future is couched in terms of which job she's going to pick, what career she'll have. And it's still just a job no matter how well it's marketed to the bourgeois class. Even religious and spiritual aspects of life have been monetized. My last CEO, one of the big famous heroes of Silicon Valley, wrote a book about sabbatical, i.e. Sabbath, and claimed its purpose is to give you time to figure out your next entrepreneurial plan to make money. <laughs> and I mean, the guy believes it. You know, like, like visions of future wealth is what life is all about. And he's basically a preacher as thousands of people buy the book thinking it's the answer to their prayers. It's what they've been looking for. They just rave about it and give it a thumbs up on Facebook. And I find this very disturbing. And this. Churches seem to be fine with compartmentalizing themselves to fit neatly into one or two hour Sunday routines. You know, just a tiny corner of our world otherwise dominated by the usury-based monetary and corporate system. Many people seem to view church as a helpful weekly recharge to get ready for their real purpose in life, which is to serve the corporate system in return for bank credit. You know, pastors and therapists might even see part of their jobs as counseling people how to be happier and more successful as corporate servants. In fact, all the patriarchs of psychology said success in a job is a component of psychological health. Wow. Co-opting a field like that shows the power of this system. Something must be wrong with you if you aren't happy being a corporate servant. And massive scale also causes a loss of community, as small towns have largely been gutted and lost their own sense of meaning while big corporate cities have taken over. Now, look, I'm a fan of cities, but we need to be aware that this is a symptom of scale growth, and we need to ask important questions like, you know, what do we do about it? How do we manage it? Is it a good thing? And as a side note, it's no accident the Empire State Building here is a pyramid. 
and it's no accident, New York is called the Empire State. It's the center of this empire, for now. We'll see later that it's shifting to Asia. Now in big cities, instead of spending our time in something natural like this, we spend our time in one of these. And that's an odd world. It's the modern hamster wheel. It can cause people to be like this. And the movie Falling Down was an extreme example, but he basically suffered from a lack of agency. By that I mean his inability to control his life and make his own mark on the world. He was, he was in touch with this issue of scale and how he was hostage to something he could do nothing about and hostage to mega institutions way above his pay grade. And this issue of scale affects all of us in negative ways, whether we're conscious of it or not. We see the issue of scale in the disappearance of local and family farming and the rise of massive agribusiness corporations that have replaced it. You can just feel the difference in these pictures, can't you? We've seen the difference in the media as mega corporate machines have replaced the local newspaper. Even the remaining local newspapers use a lot of space to report the national news. And that's because local media has lost a lot of its own meaning because towns themselves have lost their uh, a lot of their meaning. They have little purpose in the global economy. And we've seen this a lot in Hollywood. In the latest Star Trek, for example, a young James Kirk was portrayed as a drunk loser when he was in his hometown. He was called a, quote, townie, like making fun of people who want to stay connected to roots and to local community and friends and family. But then he was portrayed as a hero once he put on a weird uniform and started killing people for a living. We've seen that for decades in Hollywood. The message never seems to stop. But instead of listening to Hollywood, I hope the voice of someone like Wendell Berry starts being heard. Like him, I don't see how life continues, at least in a sane way, as local communities die. Well, that was a lot on scale, but it's a really important issue, and it's another key flaw of neoclassical economics. The profession ignores it. Completely. They have a Pavlovian resistance to seeing growth as anything other than glorious. They literally think it's where salvation is found. And since they're the high priests, their natural bias is to keep reinforcing such fantasies, because there's nothing like a little grandiosity to feed the ego of an academic overachiever. And they have no way of measuring negative impact on the human heart and local community. And that's really unfortunate because the scale of the system has been destroying them for decades. Now here's another big problem with the culture of empire. It's called velocity. This is a well-known concept among economists. They understand velocity of money, but they don't bother to note that that means velocity of humans as well. As the system grows, the engine must spin faster and faster and pump harder and harder to keep itself running. And what are the engine components? Well, that's all of us. It's human beings. And this issue causes major problems. We feel it in our endless commutes to jobs we generally don't like. We see it as both parents need to work now when one could easily support a family of five 50 years ago. We see it as some dads need to work two or three jobs to feed the kids. We feel it in the tug of war between the corporate leash of the cell phone and uh, against the natural world's call to care for family and just be with people. Sometimes it seems we feel this most when we just step out into the natural world where there is no man-made velocity machine. Nature's power to slow us down is incredible. Just go sit in the park, go on a hike, climb a mountain, and you get a taste of this. And we feel it a lot when we go on vacation, we get a taste of a different life. It's like something new starts to open up in us, but sometimes we're anxious to get back to the machine for some reason. And because of velocity, we no longer have much time for spiritual pursuits or books or art, music, sex, whatever it may be. I mean, how many of us are really satisfied with this aspect of our lives? We don't even have time for self-government. A republic depends on bottom-up participation of the people, but we don't have the time. The engine's cranking too fast. The empire system owns our time. I actually think that's the way they want it. So we're all too distracted and busy to drive government from the bottom up. They like it top-down. When it comes to books, it seems the only ones worth our time, since we have none, are those that help us be more effective narcissists or more successful in the system, or those that tell us how to make more money. 
things like rest, joy, delight, living a slow pace, watching the clouds move, listening to the waves, all of those are devalued because they don't earn money. And artists who try to call us to a different way of life are called hippies and druggies. We're even trained to make fun of people like the French and the Spanish because they have afternoon siestas. As if they'd be better off being back in one of these all afternoon. I mean, this is Twilight Zone stuff. The velocity of this system rewards the most addicted workaholics and the most ruthless overachievers. And you probably know somebody like this. I used to be one. You may be one of these folks caught in the cycle. And the worst part is, we're trained to think that's good. We're trained to call this form of existence, quote, freedom. You know, if only we had listened to Martin Luther King 40 years ago, I wonder if we can hear him today. Can you hear him, or I'm just curious, are you bristling that I'm critiquing the system in this way? It might be an interesting exercise to take a few minutes to get in touch with what you're feeling right now about this issue of velocity. And so this rounds out the top ten list. This reveals how our supposed best and brightest economists from the most elite schools are deeply wrong. They model the velocity of money, but ignore that that means the velocity of humans. So real humans had better start speaking up against these robotic Ivy League economists. They're stuck in ridiculous math models that assume away the fact that we are living, loving human beings. Here's an interesting problem caused by the culture of empire. Instead of having horizontal human relationships built on friendship and community, or things like affection and love, the pyramid opens up vertical relationships and actually makes them take precedence. Remember the pyramid in lesson one illustrated a hierarchy of power that encompasses all of us and puts us all in a particular power level. Well, a power-based hierarchical society of such massive scale, I believe, results in the loss of love and the triumph of narcissism. I think it actually enshrines narcissism. And we can see this walking around a city's business district where guys in their 30s are projecting power all over the place with their suits and slicked hair and sunglasses and just the general corporate personas. They're constantly jockeying for power, trying to establish themselves in the power hierarchy to figure out the pecking order. And one of the problems of a narcissistic society is it can cause us to look down the pyramid to blame the little people for problems. Like, remember these exponential problems we covered earlier in the lesson? The people on top actually despise the system they built. But they end up despising the little people who are hostage to it. And that's no surprise. Contempt is a trait of narcissism. I actually think Hollywood has helped prepare us for the level of narcissism we have in society today. For the last 20 years or, or more, they've been pumping out ridiculous amounts of narcissism. Narcissistic men and women, narcissistic police like all the Schwarzenegger characters, and narcissistic Wall Street executives like Michael Douglas here in the movie Wall Street. And lo and behold, here we are 20 years later with real life versions of all those things. Narcissistic men and women, narcissistic police, looking just like the Schwarzenegger characters and the stormtroopers from Star Wars. And narcissistic Wall Street executives. By the way, that's Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan Chase and Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs. Pretty darn good examples of what I'm talking about here. And there are so many more examples. It's broadcast all over the media. Narcissistic power just being thrown at us through the television. And we probably wouldn't want to be friends with any of these folks if they lived in our neighborhood. We certainly wouldn't want them babysitting our kids. Heaven forbid, but we're drawn to them in deep ways as they come through the television. We start to identify with them. TV has a way of making us feel small. And the other people on the other side of the TV screen are therefore big. So all these big, important, powerful people out there are being broadcast to just little old me sitting in the living room. We have to become aware of this issue and stop feeling small and recover our humanity, recover our local communities and, and getting to know people directly rather than relying on things broadcast to us through the television. If we can recover our humanity, humanity in that way, then we may be able to reduce another big problem of a narcissistic society, which is hero worship. Whether it's the Oscars and Grammys, or sports heroes, or savior figures like Jack Bauer, 
or are politicians, left and right both. They're narcissistic projections. They're not real people. They're actors reading from a script written by strategic marketing people who have written it in a way that it will manipulate us and make us feel a certain way. Now I suggest another result of our exponentially increasing system and the culture of empire is increasing pathology. There's this huge disconnect between the head and the heart. Our heads are indoctrinated to believe we're living in freedom and a sort of a flat society and a free market, but our guts know that's not the case. Our instinct knows we're in a top-down controlled empire system. And I think the middle class really struggles with this. As they're the ones cranking the system, thinking they're free, but feeling their truth. And in this picture, the mom feels the struggle clearly, where she has her head world in one hand and her heart and her real world in the other arm. And people like this can't really express their truth because they, they have to act like everything's fine during a normal day and put the smile on the face. And they can only talk truth behind the closed doors of like a pastor or a therapist's office. But as I said before, many therapists and pastors are trained to think their job is to help someone conform to our work system. So that can bias their work. Well, the lower class may struggle with this disconnect as well, but my guess is that they feel the weight of this pyramid. They know they're not in a free system. So carrying the simple burden of being at the bottom of such a massive scale system will likely be their struggle. And then the upper class is quite different. Remember the previous issue of narcissism? Well, if you lord over this system as a banker and become a billionaire by putting others in debt, and then later you jack up their credit card rates and kick them out of their homes, and you wear an outfit that might cost more than some people's annual salary, well, that can't help but breed narcissism. Otherwise, you know, if a person like this wasn't narcissistic, they would leave their job. They would question the sanity of the system and look for another way to contribute to community. But to stay in their jobs, they have to believe in their heads that they're doing good, which requires a narcissistic separation from reality. Then I believe there's increasing oppression as well, as even lower layers get pushed out of the pyramid. Remember the indigenous populations that have been destroyed? They didn't conform to the system. They shouldn't have had to. Maybe they couldn't. But they weren't even really given an opportunity to. They were just destroyed and pushed out. And that's not just history. This is a picture of the Aguaruna and Wampi Indians in Peru being attacked by their military and police just last year to make room for U.S. oil companies to take their land. Many of them were killed. And then we have the people that the empire system has to label handicapped and they get boxed into little enclaves because the empire system doesn't know what to do with them because they can't earn bank credit so they really have no purpose in this top-down controlled system now even though it makes a lot of people uncomfortable to talk about these issues this stuff cannot be ignored anymore and finally this system eventually overpowers governments just due to the fact that it must it must continue to grow when the economy was small enough to fit into the states, it wasn't a problem, but it eventually pushed through the borders and basically eliminated the states, as we discussed in Lesson 1, so corporations could operate nationally. Then it was only a matter of time before they pushed against the national borders. Countries have already been eliminated at the capital level, as the global bond market transcends nations and it's completely stateless, and it controls all the nations, most of the nations. And this, this, this has largely already happened at the microeconomic level as well. Everything's been offshored and outsourced, and companies operate across multiple countries. They have no national identity. And now the system's working on a global currency. Then only the political aspect of borders will remain, and I suspect the system will try to eliminate those. That's the next move. So banks and corporations, given our empire system, eventually replace the people's governments. And that's a serious problem. And so that finishes off my list of the destructive nature of the culture of empire. 
Some of you watching may have other ideas. Maybe this has triggered some other aspects of the culture of empire that you feel is destructive. Please send your ideas my way. I think we all need to dialogue about these issues. It's literally the empire versus the republic from Star Wars. It's the dark side versus the force. It's narcissism versus love. And I suggest we might want to replace the Ivy League economists that currently serve as Yoda, the high priest of our system, and start hearing the voices of our communities. Because where we're headed, if you remember the last point in this lesson, is an empire system that transcends national borders and destroys communities even more. Let's discuss that next in Lesson 5, The Emerging Global Empire. Now what you'll see in this lesson is the reason I launched this entire video series in the first place. I wanted to explain the strategic perspective on the current world scene because the media doesn't help. And even from some good news sources out there like some economic blogs, we just get rapid fire noise about markets and they sort of chalk everything up to corruption and government incompetence, but the truth is actually much more sophisticated. We're undergoing a massive strategic global transition. A few in the alternative media describe it using a bunch of emotion and hype, which is fine and works for a lot of people. But I wanted to do it in a way that would communicate to a different type of audience and attract people who think analytically and would prefer to avoid theatrics. And the first thing to remember is that we're all stuck in a system that must continually grow just based on the math of the bond market. It's pushed beyond towns, counties, and states, and is, has been pushing against nations for a long time to the point where it's now trying to establish a single integrated global system. And now I got to deal with the typical objections to this immediately because many people will be inclined to turn off the video at this point. They may call this ridiculous because they've heard versions of this new world order presented with a bunch of theatrical hype. Um, so of course they don't believe it. But I will just try to present the facts based on the monetary, corporate, and governance systems we're living in and interpret them through the lens of the history we saw in lesson one. And some say this whole thing is impossible. You know, like the world's too big. Well, it's pretty much already happened on the economic dimension. So they're either not paying attention or they aren't thinking at the right level in terms of scale, which you hopefully remember from lesson four. And others say they're too much of a believer in chaos theory to accept this. But actually, chaos theory says the exact opposite. It suggests that what we may perceive as random chaos is actually a very intricate, even predictable pattern of ripple effects stemming from a central cause or tweak to the system. And I'd suggest that's exactly what's happening in the world. The corporate media portrays nothing but the random chaos on the nightly news. But in point of fact, we are hearing the intricately patterned ripple effects of a system dominated by a few who use leverage to make powerful changes. And I'll try to illustrate the intricate pattern in this lesson. Finally, others say this is conspiracy theory. Nope, it's math. And math that requires exponential debt growth and creates incredible leverage. This is the basic math of the bond market that has transcended nation states. And to call it conspiracy is to highlight the fact that we are not taught the truth about the world's financial system. The leverage created by that system has been used to standardize governments, collapse economies, establish dollar hegemony, secure ownership rights over natural resources, and basically increase the pyramid of the Anglo banking and corporate system. Mega levels of debt is used to pull off corporate takeovers of governments, just like debt was used in the 80s to pull off corporate takeovers of companies. In other words, leverage is used to bring other countries that might be republics or another form of government into the top-down financial empire system. And it typically does this through supposed financial crises. This is how the Anglo-American empire grows externally. It's grown a lot internally by increasing the scale and velocity of the system, but it grows externally by economically conquering countries, which is way more effective than using the military. We've seen this in a multitude of countries in the past. Each of these was reported in the media as a crisis caused by governments that was fixed by the supposedly responsible financiers. Will we ever learn? How many times will the same story be repeated before people bother to notice the common pattern? The truth is that these countries were attacked by the financiers in the first place, and typically the governments had no idea what was happening to them, or they were bought off. And what was almost never reported was how the structure of each of these countries has changed as a result of the crisis. How its resources were handed over to corporate institutions. How the country was put into 
even more debt from the IMF and commercial banks like J.P. Morgan Chase and all the other aspects of restructuring that occurred coming out of these crises. The same thing is going to happen in other countries. We'll see it in these European countries. We'll see it eventually in the bigger developed countries of Europe. And we'll see it in the United States. And this will bring the rest of the world into a depression, which will be used in the same way the Great Depression of the 20th century was used, as we saw in Lesson 1, to force nations to submit to a new debt-based system. And before we get into the details of that system, we need to understand the strategic economic picture of the world today. How does this big American pyramid we've been discussing fit into the strategic perspective? Well, first, it's tied to Britain via the Bank of England and the British Empire system. This is why I've called it the Anglo-American Empire. It's really a joint venture. And it lords over most of, West, of the Western Hemisphere. The smaller pyramids of Canada and Mexico are tied to it, and most of South America is managed by it. South America really isn't its own pyramid, but is rather a satellite system. And South and Central America are largely tied to the dollar, run by the CIA and the State Department, and our banks and corporations. Of course, Venezuela is a big exception, and Brazil is a production powerhouse that could break away and be its own pyramid if it got creative. But to understand the strategic perspective, it's useful to view the entire hemisphere as at least being heavily influenced by the Anglo-American Empire. Then across the Atlantic is the rest of Europe. Germany and the smaller European countries are their own productive pyramids, but they're controlled by the Anglo-American financial system. And Africa and much of the Middle East are satellites. The British Empire has maintained control by fueling chaos in Africa for centuries, and they have powerful influence over the Middle East, since the Arabian royal system is an extension of the British royal system. And where the royal system doesn't have control, that's where you see the American military moving in. Then the third primary economic system of the world is in Asia, mainly Japan and China. Like Britain, Japan is a financial empire run by a royal family, and China is a mega production powerhouse that will dominate the 21st century. And the rest of Asia is largely controlled by these powers and the Anglo-American financial system. And these regions are tied together by, guess what? It's the bond market, represented here by the dotted lines, and they're also tied by the global central banking network and the international institutions like the IMF and the BIS. And then the G20 is the group of economists and politicians from the primary developed countries who are making this globalization happen. So this picture of the world today is the trilateral chessboard. And I use that name deliberately. It's the work of the Trilateral Commission and the other planning bodies of the global empire. And they view the world as a chessboard. Key Trilateral Commission members of Big New Brzezinski wrote a book called The Grand Chessboard, which made this quite clear. And he now runs the strategic policy of the Obama administration. Now, one critical piece of the chessboard is not in this diagram yet. Russia. Yeltsin was going along with the American plan, the Anglo-American plan, but Putin has thrown a wrench in it. He's a nationalist that would rather not be conquered by the central banks, commercial banks like J.P. Morgan Chase, and industrial oligarchs, many of whom he put in prison. But it's not clear if he's being used by higher powers as a key attack piece on the chessboard, or if he's truly independent. The global strategists rely on dialectical conflict to shape the world, so Russia could very well be a useful dialectical chess piece. I tend to doubt it because the CIA is very worried about Putin, but we'll see in the near future. And Russia has power with other anti-corporate states like Iran and Venezuela. So this is the key wild card. Will this power block be able to leverage relationships with, say, China to checkmate the Anglo-American system? Well, I expect the global financiers will try to collapse nations to control the outcome here by using the same tactic we saw in Lesson 1 to create the American financial empire. A major global depression is on the way, as I mentioned a couple slides back, as the U.S. goes into a financial crisis. This will cripple the nations like the Great Depression crippled the states. And along with depressions come global wars. So we will see World War III launched by the Anglo-American Empire against the RAN and the powers that come to its aid. The world's population and most nations will be demoralized and fairly powerless to solve the problem, which will allow for a new potential pyramid to be created, just like we saw in Lesson 1. A new global, global currency, which will be debt-based, of course, will be introduced in order to crank up a new global debt machine. 
and before that machine can launch, a new global tax engine needs to be created. We've seen glimpses of that in the press that propose banking tax, internet tax, carbon tax, and transaction tax, all sorts of taxes which would be used to fuel a new global government. But it's not really been created yet. And my guess is that it won't be accepted by much of the world until they experience some of this pain from Depression 2.0 and World War III. But once it's established, the machine will be ready to crank up the 21st century with a new elite banking layer, which will, by the way, be largely centered in Asia. The largest banks are now in China. Asian financial institutions have a massive amount of the world's assets at this point, while the Western nations and institutions have an equally massive amount of debt. The G2 relationship plays a critical role here. It's the banker's way of tying the U.S. and China together, so they will have control over both governments. And that's certainly worked with the U.S. government. It's pretty much run by the bankers exclusively. But we'll see if China continues to play their game. Regardless, it's no accident that China seems to be the country most typically associated in the press with a new world economic order. So once the currency and tax system is in place, and the people of the world have experienced enough pain to accept anything to get themselves out of it, the new global debt machine will crank up out of Asia, because banks need assets to run their leveraging machine, and that's where all the assets are. It will reinflate the system over the course of several decades, pumping debt through the nations based on the new currency, and taxing the value back up to the top. Structurally, it will end up looking almost exactly like the empire system we've discussed in this series. The differences are that this one will be ruled by the Bank of International Settlements and the IMF, or some other global banking institution that has yet to be announced, and now the administrative districts will be nations rather than states. It will depend on a global interest and tax system to feed the top, just like the pyramid from Lesson 1, and the interest part already exists. That's just the global bond market, where most nations already feed the central banking system. This system will also have the notion of too big to fail to justify stealing from the world's population to prop up the elite institutions. We've already seen this as the U.S. government stripped wealth from its people to hand it over to foreign banking interests. And that happened both from direct payments from Treasury and indirect shenanigans played by the Federal Reserve. So that means the U.S. government is already playing this global too big to fail game. Beyond the willingness to hand its people's wealth over to foreign banks, the U.S. government is currently the primary enforcement body for the global administrative districts. That's the purpose of State Department, the CIA, along with Britain's MI5 and 6 being in nearly every country in the world. We're ensuring global conformity and compliance. And when nations don't comply, well, the Defense Department comes in and stomps all over. It's no surprise that the U.S. military is leading campaigns in areas of the world that have thus far refused to submit to the Anglo banking and corporate system. And what I'm saying here may be upsetting some of your patriotic emotions, but just think about it. Not only are state and CIA in most of the world, but the U.S. military is in 75% of all countries. 75%! We're supposedly a free republic. We started as a nation opposed to the very idea of standing armies, and today our standing army controls far more global territory than King George III ever dreamed of. It's quite clear we're building a global empire. Things are changing domestically as well. The U.S. government is morphing into a top-down control system based on the Chinese model. And that's the purpose of Homeland Security. Despite the PR and marketing, it exists to clamp down on American citizens, shifting the U.S. government from one that gets its power from the consent of the governed to one that gets its power from controlling the governed. And we've seen this kind of shift around the world. As nations conform more to the Chinese model of control, the goal is to replace them all with the United Nations or some other form of global government that maintains standardization across the board. A new government system running on the new global taxation system, it's an important part of the future plan, but just like in Lesson 1, the government is really just a secondary power. When compared to the real power in this system, the most senior financial interests in the world. The Bank of England, its extension, the Federal Reserve, and the rest of the primary central banks. Real top-down power in the empire system I've described since Lesson 1 comes from controlling people's money and the people's governments with debt. Government works for those controllers and is just used to keep the people in line to protect the financiers while the debt machine does its magic. To understand more about this future system, we need to look at it from a perspective of class. Now, some of you hear that and immediately think, you know, whoa, this guy's a commie. 
No, I'm just describing the reality of the situation rather than believing the false propaganda that we live in a free, classless society. Look, Karl Marx was wrong about a whole lot, but he was right about this thing called the bourgeois class. I know it well. So did Teddy Roosevelt. This is what he said. This group drives this system and builds the oligarchy at the top. Put the right bonus plan and incentives in front of them, and they will run around the racetrack like any good racehorse, collecting their prize. They need to take the blinders off. Many of them know in their guts they're not fulfilling the real purpose for their lives, but their heads are trained to think they are. Roosevelt was right that the ones that really succeed in the system because they're devoted to nothing else generally don't know much and aren't really worth listening to. Well, that is unless you're interviewing with them for a job. But here's a couple examples of these people. When you have time, listen to a recent Jamie Dimon speech at Harvard Business School on YouTube to see how a guy so admired by the elite media and being set up as a future Treasury Secretary is a total empty suit and still sounds like a college frat boy with nothing meaningful to say even though he's in his 50s. This is an example of the type of person in this class. He's devoted his life to getting rich by putting millions in debt and stripping the world of its resources and value to put it in the deep pockets of the folks behind Chase, City, and other Wall Street firms, and that's all he knows. Or remember from the first season of The Apprentice when during a tour of his gold penthouse in New York, Donald Trump said, this is what life's all about. Really? You know, that's not even worth responding to. The point is self-evident. And I'm not trying to attack these, these guys personally as much as I'm trying to just have us reflect on the system we've been living in for such a long time. And one of the things Marx was wrong about was only identifying these bourgeois types and the proletariat. He didn't point out the ruling class above both of them. And that was a terrible mistake. The world has lived for a century believing not only that the Wall Street-driven capitalism has no aristocracy, but also that communism has none. The fact is both are ruled from a central top-down power. And the top-down system in this planned global empire is based on the British system of an imperial ruling class and a financial ruling class operating together to maintain total control. Then below the ruling class is the bourgeois, the top of which in the U.S. is found in the Council on Foreign Relations. I mentioned this club in Lesson 3. It's partially above the line here because the inner circle of core financiers in CFR are part of the global ruling class. But most of the council is just the mindless bourgeois, the careerists, the uppity, those who are easily co-opted by the ruling class to make sure they do their bidding. They're fairly clueless about what's really going on. Then the World Economic Forum in Davos is an important club of the bourgeois class. I label them globalists because a key for the ruling class's plan is to create a new bourgeois with no national allegiance. And they've done so. These people enjoy hobnobbing in Monaco and Davos above the fray of nationalism, which they think is only for the dumb masses of the world. And then the Clinton Global Initiative is another key organization for building the globalist bourgeois class. This one brings cachet and star personality. Most people wouldn't be interested in hanging out with the old Wall Street control freaks that run the CFR, even though they brought Angelina Jolie into it to try to increase its star power. But if you have a guy like Clinton running a sister organization to recruit many more people from the cool crowd, then you get a lot more momentum behind your initiative to create a global corporate empire. The math of the bond market is the key to building this empire, but the ruling class needs the bourgeois to move along with it in order to really make it happen. And that's the purpose of these organizations. And then at the bottom of the pyramid are all the servants and the enforcers who will keep them in line. You see this type of police force being built in almost every country around the world. Again, this is not random chaos. It's an intricate pattern that makes it clear countries are becoming standardized on the Chinese model. So looking at the empire from this class perspective helps us understand what's been called the New World Order. Don't worry about all the films that depict it as a result of evil demons and macabre forces. It's actually a very real, very human, and quite simple system being used to expand our current monetary system to the rest of the globe. It's what we covered in Lessons 1, 2, and 3, only now it's expanding to do to the rest of the world in the 21st century what it did to America in the 20th. It created a system where everyone is helplessly dependent on mega institutions for their survival. The system is doing the same globally. So forget the idea that this is a loving sort of global community where we're all holding hands. Rather, it's a system driving meaningless, mindless growth for the sake of creating a corporatized planet where everything is managed by spreadsheets and bond traders. As lower class folks outside the U.S. already know, 
This just results in a few financiers getting rich while everyone else is controlled and poor. If you remember Wendell Berry from Lesson 4, he has said the same thing. We must start teaching people how the math of debt-based money vacuums wealth to the top of the pyramid, leaving others in debt, and therefore poor. And it's not just poor in financial terms. As Lesson 4 illustrated, besides material goods and economic statistics, this empire system values none of the deeper things that human beings typically value. All these things get reduced to afterthoughts. Pursuing bank credit to pay debt and taxes becomes the purpose of life in this system. And this is not a recipe for a new enlightenment, a new renaissance, or anything else worth pursuing. It's the recipe for the next dark ages. Do you want to see that? If not, it's time to break your silence and start speaking out. We can create Renaissance 2.0 instead of the next dark ages, but you need to play an active role. The next lesson considers how to do this. And it's time for us to start talking about a brighter future. Welcome to Lesson 6. It's time to discuss a brighter future. And we first need to start by digging into this word vortex, because it's the force that runs everything in our system. So here's a good example of a vortex. It's a satellite image of Hurricane Katrina, and this overlay shows the forces operating within it. Energy from the outer bands gets sucked into the center to fuel the storm, and that spiral sucking power is a vortex. It's an example of a centripetal force. So a hurricane is basically a breakdown in the equilibrium of the atmosphere, as centripetal forces pulling to the center completely overwhelm centrifugal forces pushing out. Normally these forces are in balance in nature. Earth itself is a good example of this, where gravity is a centripetal force constantly pushing inward on the Earth, but Earth's rotation provides a powerful centrifugal force which keeps it from collapsing. So Earth has a good balance between centripetal and centrifugal forces, and a vortex is a breakdown in this balance. It's a temporary state of disequilibrium where centripetal forces overwhelm centrifugal. Now, wh why in the world am I talking about this? because it's precisely the math of our debt-based monetary system. It's the math of the bond market and the banking system which creates all money. They create it by putting everything else in debt. Every single dollar in our system comes from debt, so it's always being pulled back to the center. Every dollar is tied at the hip to the central banking cartel. And think about that. Think about the power this group of people at the center has. They control every dollar. This is again why what I discussed in Lesson 5 is not a fake conspiracy theory because no group in history has ever had this kind of power. Everything and everybody is hostage to it. Governments are dwarfed by it and are currently being sucked into the vortex, with Greece being the most obvious example. And the power of this storm even transcends time. For every dollar in the system, a dollar plus interest is being sucked back to the financiers at the center. But of course, the money to pay the interest doesn't exist yet, so there's a time dimension to the vortex. The money we get from banks is notional money called credit, which gets created by sucking it from the future. And elite banks drive the growth and power of the vortex, and the Fed is their mechanism for establishing this one superpower vortex with no competition. The Fed accommodates the cartel banks whenever necessary by maintaining the low pressure in the center so they can keep sucking in outer band energy with debt. And this is a way better definition of inflation than you'll ever get from economics. Prices have little to do with microeconomic supply and demand when this macro vortex is driving everything. Nor do simplistic versions of the quantity theory of money from 50 years ago explain inflation. And inflation has almost nothing to do with government printing money, which no longer occurs in this system. True inflation, credit inflation, that drives this vortex is caused by the private sector cartel at the center. Government is just a willing accomplice. And to understand this better, we would need to go back to this issue of time. Is using the vortex diagram in a different way, we could plot time from zero at the center to 30-year bonds on the edge, and what's called the yield curve would illustrate the relative air pressure across the vortex, which drives its sucking power and growth dynamics. It's precisely the same as air pressure curves in a hurricane. But I'll have to do this in a future video. The bottom line now is that as long as people are willing to borrow more, the private cartel keeps the vortex inflating. We were probably a Cat 1 or 2 hurricane when the system would have deflated in the late 80s without Fed and Treasury intervention. Then we were probably a Cat 3 back in 97 when long-term capital management was saved. Then a Cat 4 as the tech bubble burst. And then Greenspan kept us on course toward Cat 5 by lowering the central pressure of the storm even more. So we're now at the Cat 5 point. The system can't grow anymore. 
And that's going to be catastrophic for those of us caught in the outer bands. Of course, it wasn't really just Greenspan, but actually the greater cartel operating in collusion behind the scenes of the New York Fed and the Council on Foreign Relations, which of course also controls the U.S. Treasury. They run the vortex. So what if we want to change this dynamic? What would be a centrifugal force that could balance the centripetal vortex forces? Well, the sucking power of the vortex comes from debt-based money, so the opposing force would be sovereign money. Money that's not sucked from the future. Money that's not attached to increasing interest payments. Money that these guys and the people that work for them on Wall Street can't get their hands on because it's in your hands. It's not electronic digits sitting in their hands for their own leveraging and profit purposes. Sovereign money doesn't depend on the decisions of the Fed. It can't be sucked to the center of the vortex. In fact, sovereign money only becomes more valuable as these guys crank up the storm. But the problem is that sovereign money has been taken from the people since the bankers took over the U.S. Treasury to make everyone dependent on the vortex. And this needs to be reversed. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing matters more to our lives and our freedom right now than making this issue happen. It's happened before. Greenbacks under Lincoln weren't governed by the vortex. Gold and silver coins held by the people aren't governed by it. And silver certificates under JFK weren't either. Now, by the way, since I'm showing gold here, this is very different from a gold standard where the banks have the gold. Those advocating a return to that type of gold standard we've seen in the past don't seem to realize it was a similar debt-based vortex where bankers collected gold and pumped out debt paper to the people. It's what led to the system we have today. A system without money free of the vortex. Does this look like freedom? This is the key dynamic to break. All the other talk about inflation and government deficits, gold standards and taxes and whatever else, it's all, it's all missing the mark. And it's useful to flip this diagram on its side to see the hurricane vortex from a different perspective. As energy from the outer bands is sucked toward the center, it's forced upward, so the storm builds into a vertical pyramid. These are the Hamiltonian vertical forces addressed in earlier lessons. And they're driven by debt. Again, debt's a sucking vortex force. Uh, so the higher up the force is, the higher the storm will be. Basically, driving more leverage into the system pulls the storm higher. So as we shifted from base money to M1 checking and savings accounts long ago, the storm grew in intensity. Then the system continued increasing leverage into M2 and M3. And then into crazy new forms of leverage like derivatives. And that was the real purpose of derivatives. It was a new, higher form of sucking power the financial system used to push us from the Cat 4 hurricane we were uh, in that started to deflate 10 to 12 years ago to a full-blown Cat 5. And the institutions with the most derivatives have the highest sucking power and therefore the most control over the system. So that's why J.P. Morgan Chase basically runs the show. Given their absurd derivatives position, they have the highest claim on capital, and they sit at the highest level of the storm. So we're living in a vortex governed by J.P. Morgan and the Fed cartel banks, not in a republic governed by our elected leaders. Yet Chase has the gall to put out a debt card called Chase Freedom, straight out of Orwell's 1984. And by the way, as you probably notice already, the Vortex is actually in the Chase logo. Most of the people in the bank don't have a clue what they're doing, but the people who control the bank behind the scenes know exactly how it works. And in today's economy, most of the activity in the storm is just happening up here in the Wall Street casino with the money pushers, not down in the outer bands of the real economy where the money users are scrambling. There isn't much left for the Vortex to suck in to keep fueling the storm's growth. And I actually think it's going to result in massive deflation. My guess is we'll see the storm deflate back to a Cat 1, which will be catastrophic for the outer bands, i.e. most of the population. The kickoff for that will be the run on the dollar, at which point my guess is the Fed won't hesitate to jack up short rates to defend its portfolio, which effectively raises the pressure at the center of the hurricane and deflates it. Deflation maintains centripetal power, whereas it evaporates in hyperinflation, which would be like the hurricane slamming ashore and chaotically breaking up. I don't think that will be allowed, but it's actually a possibility now that they're dumping every piece of crap on the Fed's balance sheet. They may be preparing to hyperinflate it away now that the potential for the next centripetal vortex has been built in Asia. But I think they prefer to deflate to a steady state vortex like they pulled off in Japan for 20 years. Time will tell. Anyway, this perspective on the storm is precisely the pyramid structure we've been discussing since Lesson 1. The masses are at the bottom in the outer bands, corporations are a key part of the upper storm, and banks sit at the top inside the eye, sucking everything else in the system toward themselves. 
As long as the storm is growing in strength during inflation, people on the outer bands feel like they're making progress and getting richer and having some fun and the energy of the whole thing. But once the storm runs aground or starts deflating, the truth is revealed. We were just caught in an unsustainable vortex fueled by sucking value from us as we create it. Which is why a few people through history warned about this issue. This is just a sampling of the names and I don't know, maybe you've heard of these people? But instead, we've chosen to listen to names like these. I think it's a big mistake listening to a few Harvard corporate suits compared to some of the most admired people in history who are generally known for timeless principles and trying to stand for humanity, while the Ivy Leaguers here are just pursuing power and paychecks. They're salesmen, working for the elites behind the Council on Foreign Relations. Well, I think it's safe to say we chose the wrong people to listen to. All right, so now let's take a closer look at the dynamics in the pyramid as the cartel banks create liquidity. And I'll show that storm diagram again here in the background as we talk through this. So the banks create liquidity by holding the debt of both the private sector and the public sector. And note, they really aren't pumping out actual money, but just putting everything else in the system in debt, which sucks the outer bands into the vortex. And that debt generates all the corporate spending and government spending in the system, which sucks all of us into the storm. And then the value we create gets sucked in and pumped back up the pyramid through interest and taxes. And this cash flow diagram here means that the pyramid governs both the private sector economy and the public sector. These aren't really two different systems, but two components of one monetary vortex, which reveals the lie of the cliched socialism versus capitalism debate. The versions of socialism and capitalism we live under today are actually part of the same system. And note that this isn't community-level socialism advocated by classic liberals, but mega-national socialism controlled by D.C. Nor is this the small-town sort of free-market Main Street advocated by classic conservatives, but mega-empire-level capitalism controlled by Wall Street and imperial corporations. So these aren't two different systems, but two sides of one financial dictatorship that runs everything out of Wall Street and D.C., and that word dictatorship probably sounds harsh, but it's really worth dwelling on this until you see through the freedom propaganda. And here's just one example. A country where a couple Ivy League economists can get the central executive to transfer trillions in wealth from 308 million people up to bankers, the richest clique in the country, by definition, that's a dictatorship. And as discussed in Lesson 4, the system is driving us perpetually toward bigness. Big government on the left of this diagram and big business on the right. And this means we're living in hidden fascism. Fascism wasn't really about Hitler or what our history books tell us. It's about mega banking institutions fueling big government and big corporate business, both of which work together to control everything. That's the powerful, efficient structure of fascism. The politician that happens to be in office at the time has very little to do with it. And then we can see another aspect of what I'm calling fascism here, if we break the public debt half of the diagram into left versus right. So we can see here how public debt fuels both sides of our political system. The left sells the population into deeper indebtedness with welfare arguments, and the right does the same with warfare. The big bank cartel profits massively off of both. They don't care which is in office. And these are the primary programs of the Democrat and Republican parties. They may appear to be different choices, but they both fuel the same power structure. Now, why bother with having two parties when they're actually part of the same system? Well, because to maintain power, it's important to give people a choice while hiding the real structure. We're trained to be devoted to our left or right political leader, and this brilliantly fuels the system while also keeping us in the dark about who really runs things. Then how does this really work? Well, the system basically operates on third... Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But when it comes to politics, I don't think they're equal. <laughs> the reaction is typically more extreme than the action. So we had this guy 20 years ago who generated the flip to this guy, generating an opposite reaction to a more extreme warfare candidate, and then a more extreme welfare candidate who's using words like czar to trigger extreme anti-left sentiment. So there's a chance that the next reaction is going to be so extreme to the right that the fascism that's been building for a long time will finally come fully out of hiding. Maybe not, but 
we'll see whether people will wake up to this process before it's too late. So this reveals how the vortex of the financial empire system hijacks and controls our political system. Left versus right doesn't give us a choice for change because it's a controlled system that further fuels the vortex. So as we continue watching the pendulum swing between left and right, nothing changes. This is dialectical conflict, the method used by the people in power throughout history to control the masses. Our political system is nothing but a big diversion to keep you from seeing the real issue, which is not the question of left versus right, but rather big versus small. The real choice should be between the vortex-driven empire system on top here and the republic on bottom. The republic is just a group of smaller entities like people and neighborhoods, communities and states. This is the old Hamilton versus Jefferson issue from Lesson 1. Hamilton pushed for big empire systems while Jefferson warned against them. An establishment left and right politicians sit at the top of this quadrant. They're both Hamiltonians. And they're the ones that get in office because the banks and corporations put them there. And the few D.C. politicians like Dennis Kucinich and Ron Paul who are actually trying to serve the republic are extremely rare. They're on the bottom quadrants here. So while we think the two guys on top are radically different, they're actually serving the same system. They have the exact same CFR staff surrounding them making all the decisions. And this means Obama has a lot more in common with Bush than with Kucinich, who sits on his side of the aisle. And the banking establishment and corporate system are happy buying elections for people like this because they win either way. Neither of these top two quadrants will do anything about the vortex, except fuel it further. And it's sad to see the people who feel the loss of community, the people who really feel this big versus small issue, they vote for this quadrant every time, which just keeps fueling the big, when they really should be voting for the types of people that are down here. But you'll never see money power support these guys. They advocate things that oppose the central vortex, and that's the key difference. If your politicians aren't doing this, they're serving bankers at the top of the vortex. Now, I don't think most of them know it. They're, I guess, decent people, but if they're not willing to learn about this issue, get rid of them. At this point, we can't afford the classic good guy that's ignorant when we're up against the concentrated banking powers fueling the hurricane, building the empire, discussed in Lesson 5. So the key pendulum we should be focused on is big versus small not left versus right. The pendulum has naturally tried to swing back to the small side many times, but as we discussed in earlier lessons, the financial system always prevented that with their bailouts and too-big-to-fail schemes that stole from the small to prop up the big. And there have been some benefits of bigness. I don't deny that, but there's always trade-offs. And now the, pendulum's, the pendulum has swung so far to the big side that it needs to be allowed to swing back. This is the old liberty versus tyranny debate. It's the Republic versus the Empire. The Jeffersonian tradition representing the Republic against Hamilton's empire system centered in Wall Street and Washington, D.C. Now maybe you're thinking that we can't go back in history so restoring the Republic isn't the answer. And that's certainly an argument that can be made. But whether we go back to the Republic or figure out a different solution, make no mistake, we're facing the choice between individual lives, human relationships, and human freedom versus the monolithic, dehumanizing vortex system that controls everything from the center and treats us all as nothing more than digits in a spreadsheet. This is extremely dangerous. I got exposure to this mentality when I was at Harvard Business School. It's very real. The masses are nothing but spreadsheet, spreadsheet digits to these people. And I heard classmates from rich Wall Street families say that people like Stalin and Hitler were simply system managers who were just running alternative people management systems. These financiers said things like this aren't a question of morality. You know, like Hitler and Stalin aren't an issue of right versus wrong, but just a matter of efficiency and effectiveness, like which system works best. And I couldn't believe I heard that. I'm not trying to scare you here, but just giving you insight about the people who control our lives, the money powers, and the Harvard elites. This is what Wendell Berry said about them. Viewing life as system management is pathological, folks. But that's the mindset of the people who control our lives. So the key to changing our destiny and avoiding a dark future is to break the power of the vortex. And one of the keys to doing that is, again, sovereign money, pumped out by the U.S. Treasury as we already discussed. Without this, the vortex has no opposing force. 
Sovereign money flows through the system as an asset, not an interest-bearing debt like our current money system. So it doesn't contribute to the sucking power of the vortex. It can't be sucked from you so easily. It's the best way for you to have any power outside the vortex. And it's the only way to start fixing the problem of the U.S. government working for banks, as we'll talk about next. So sovereign money starts to fix the fundamental problem exhibited in this diagram where the government sits under the banks. Didn't you think your government was in charge? Well, as long as it can't issue its own money and has to be in debt to banks, it's not. And sovereign money is the answer to this issue. It would basically increase the ratio of M0, or base currency, to all the credit money provided by banks. M1, 2, and 3, plus all the off-balance sheet fraud we see today. Not only does it increase the ratio, but it fixes the fact that we really have no base currency because all we have is issued by a private banking cartel rather than our own government. So, this is the first and most important agenda item. And now, a lot of the people who are aware of the energy and environmental problems we face might be thinking that resetting the system with sovereign money would just kick off more exponential growth, but remember, the absurd levels of growth, scale, and velocity we see in the system come from the vortex fueled by debt-based money. The sovereign money and lower leverage would slow the system down and reduce the scale. But it would do so in the interests of the people rather than the banks. And the Fed would have to be nationalized, and we would need to build the right structure to control the quantity of sovereign money. Not just the quantity going in, but also the quantity being sucked out, which means usury laws would be needed to keep the banks from jacking up interest rates to the triple digits to vacuum up the sovereign money. The state banking system should take over the regional Fed functions. Banks would need to be put through standard bankruptcy procedures in court to mark the debt down in an orderly way that serves the people. And derivatives would need to be worked down, and financiers for forced to take a loss. And of course, the too big to fail must be broken up. This imperial cartel is the problem. But now the U.S. government has been doing the exact opposite of all these things for a long time, especially since the crash of 2008, because it's implementing the bankers' plans. Remember, every key federal official is in the CFR, the banker club. So this plan is impossible yet, but as JFK said, rather than sitting back and letting Wall Street, Washington, D.C. do whatever they want for us, or to us, to be more accurate, we got to be proactive and take action. So looking at this imperial power system, what can we do? Well, I've already discussed how sovereign money would break the vortex that built this structure, but since the feds are doing nothing about it yet, what else can we do? Well, just keep working our way down the pyramid. Pull our money from Wall Street. Use credit unions. Use, use anything except the big banks like J.P. Morgan Chase. Don't fall for their freebies. And we need to stop serving the corporate system, both on the supply side in terms of working for it and on the demand side by buying everything from it. And I know this is tough. We all think we're hostage to it, and to some degree we are. But by continuing to play along, we're only guaranteeing the death of the republic and the rise of the global empire discussed in Lesson 5. Now I'll talk about the key to enable us to walk away from it after I mention this. The television. Turn it off. <laughs> This is so important. Everything we know about the world is fed to us through this fake electronic matrix controlled by a few corporations, which are in turn controlled by the money powers. Now, to replace this pyramid, we need to build the community uh, that will replace the system by leveraging the power of a republic by working at a lower level. Remember the states that were in the pyramid back in Lesson 1? Well, they still exist. And so do the counties, the towns, and the potential for local community. So this is the key. We must make these levels of society function by participating in them directly. Make them do their jobs. A republic depends on bottom-up participation. So rather than racing around the corporate empire, we must get involved with our state legislatures. There are some state officials that want to reassert state power, but if we aren't talking to them and pushing specific actions through them, they're stuck only hearing from the bank lobbyists. And they know that they don't have you at their back. We need to push them to spend money into the system as an asset rather than submitting to Wall Street tyranny and being forced to borrow. They can't borrow anymore. They're bankrupt because of this system. But look into the Minnesota Transportation Act to see how people are pushing one state to recover its sovereignty. And push them to look at the state chartered banking system in North Dakota as a way to recover some autonomy from Wall Street. Join a transition town or start your own. Run for office. Get involved at the precinct level so the parties have bottom-up forces rather than purely top-down money powers driving them from Wall Street. And reconnect with your local communities and neighborhoods. 
start talking about how to work together to develop independence from the corporate system. And we can go further down the pyramid by or below the corporate powers to academia, government, and the military and law enforcement, which have all been co-opted by this system. We have to recognize how we've been programmed by this system through our lives, by the imperial education system and the media. And academic professionals, you need to pursue truth and recognize how the pyramid controls your profession. Also, homeschool the kids or community school them. Letting the state raise kids is one of the keys to how this pyramid got built in the first place. And when it comes to government, don't vote or otherwise participate in the national level elections if your only option is one of the corporate candidates. By participating, you're giving legitimacy to utter illegitimacy. Instead, spend all your political energies at the level of the republic, states, counties, and towns, and again, turn off the TV. It sucks us into the national election like the Super Bowl. And that's why we're so consumed with presidential elections but don't care about lower-level elections. And for the government officials, learn about this pyramid. Stop serving it. Stop being so willing to robotically do what you're told. Think for yourself and serve the country rather than banks. And same goes for my old military colleagues and law enforcement. You're serving Wall Street and the corporate system. Read what James Madison said about standing armies. Read what General Smedley Butler said. Listen to Dwight Eisenhower's warnings. Stand down. And everyone else, again, turn off the TV. It hides the fact that the military is basically working for Wall Street. Now, none of this might sound like the big secret answer to solving our problems, but that's because there is no easy answer. Stopping empires is extremely hard work, and the power of the one we're in today is like none other in history. It keeps us, all of us, caught way down here at the bottom, dominated by very powerful forces. And this is why we aren't already doing the things listed on the previous slides. We feel like we're being held hostage. And we've discussed how the monetary system distorts economics to hold us hostage. In fact, this academic field is now just pure groupthink for the banks to hide the truth of the monetary system. But the empire deeply influences other critical aspects of our lives as well, like psychology. Lesson 4 discussed how it affects our own psychology since we're for the most part, mindlessly spinning parts inside the system. But it also dominates the academic field itself. It stuffs it into the box of the financial and corporate system. And people that don't conform to the pyramid are called abnormal, or sent for therapy or given medications. Out-of-the-box thinking, or more accurately, out-of-the-pyramid thinking, <laughs> is squeezed out of the profession. And the same thing happens with spirituality. And I'm not just talking about religion here, but the far broader sense of how we all find meaning in life. Lesson 4 discussed how the scale of the money system is squeezed out most meaning since everything is monetized. You know, the primary meaning of our lives is just to play our small part in the mega machine. And the remaining pockets of spirituality are sucked into the vortex. For example, Western religions, they don't speak about usury anymore. The very foundation of the vortex in our society. And a lot of them tend to fuel the vortex further in order to sort of fit in and be accepted by encouraging material pursuits and monetary abundance. So spirituality is very much in the box as well. And all of these feed on each other. And they do so in ways with cycles of negative energy or positive energy. And I think it's pretty clear that the current system is a cycle of negative energy. Now what about philosophy? Well, it doesn't really exist in this pyramid. Philosophy is free thinking. And by definition, that's out of the box thinking. And there's no room for that given the scale of the pyramid we're in and the scarcity of money that forces us to devote our lives to mindlessly pursuing credit and watching TV rather than thinking. So the pyramid is about conformity and subjugating humans to its boundaries. That's the opposite of philosophy. It's system management. And I briefly mentioned this before. Remember the disturbed mind of the certain type of Harvard Business School financier? We're caught in a dehumanizing system that churns us as numbers, which is preventing the necessary awakening from happening so that the vortex could be opposed. It's preventing the next enlightenment by diminishing human freedom and awareness. And besides the monetary system itself, the primary mechanism in the U.S. for the financial powers in this pyramid to prevent that enlightenment is the CFR. As mentioned in Lesson 3, it's the group of system management Ivy Leaguers and ruthless overachievers centered around the financiers at the top of the pyramid, and they dominate all these professions. They control all power centers in society. Almost every important person in these fields is in this group. I know some of them. I worked with them. I went to school with them. The group is very real. 
And what Wendell Berry says about these types of people here is true. Just like what he said in the last video about their pathology was true. They prefer big systems, not local community and local people. They're generally narcissists, so they're the last people we would want running our lives. And this needs to stop. We must move beyond narcissism and the pathology of system management to start doing the types of things we've been talking about in this video. So to unleash enlightenment forces and renew humanity by allowing spirituality, psychology, and economics some freedom to bubble up and escape the pyramid, a new council that stands for philosophical openness is necessary. And that's the Council on Spiritual, Psychological, and Economic Renewal. It's the group driven by us, by bottom-up forces looking toward the brighter future of Renaissance 2.0, rather than the top-down forces in the CFR taking us in a dark direction. Which do you prefer? I hope you join us on the brighter path.